State Representatives Julie Johnson, a Farmers Branch, Venton Jones of Dallas, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. So here we are in Pride Month, and I wanted to ask you, we just got rid of or ended the, the first regular session uh, of the legislature. In the context of Pride Month, how are you feeling about what was accomplished in, this, in the legislature? You know, I have really mixed feelings about it. The, the, the LGBT community is really under attack in the Texas State Legislature. They filed 144 anti-LGBT bills uh, really targeting our community. Um, you know, Representative Jones and I were part of the LGBT caucus and we were able to defeat 141 of them. But the three that passed have devastating consequences to our community. I definitely agree. We have uh, so much uh, to acknowledge during, during Pride Month uh, regarding the achievements of the LGBTQ community. And so it's very important to focus on those things, but it's, it's, we cannot forget this legislative session that we've just come out of mm -hmm. and how we spent so much time attacking LGBTQ people that we couldn't get the real things done that we needed to get, focus, or to, needed to get done. Uh, property tax relief, uh, more support for our teachers and, and, and students at this time, and so many other issues um, that needed to be focused on. And so during this month, it is, there's a lot to celebrate, but there's still so much work uh, to be done to continue to, to support LGBTQ people and, and Texan families right now. And what are both of you, what have you heard from folks in the community as to the bills that were passed? And we'll get into those three bills that you mentioned, but what have you heard uh, from people? Concern. There are a lot of LGBTQ people that are concerned that they need to leave uh, the state right now. Um, there was actually remarks from the governor that um, acknowledged the concerns that came. I think it was actually asked at a press conference um, about uh, from families. So it's gone as far as the governor's office, as far as concerns that families have ex uh, expressed about the need to leave Texas because of the bills that have been put forward that are very dangerous to their families right now. Yeah, people are scared. You know, they don't know what's coming next and wh where is the state moving? You know, it seems like I've been now three terms. Every single legislative session, there is an attack on the agenda of the LGBT community. Every single time. It's like they have to check their box that they've come after us. And they get their bill passed or their three bills passed and then they can move on to something else. But they've acknowledged to the red meat base uh, that they're coming after us. And our community, we're scared and we're tired of it. That's right. We do not need to be the political punching bag of the GOP. And we need a state that values the LGBT people in it and the citizens of Texas and, and understands and has policies that recognizes the vast contributions that LGBT people make to the state and its economy. Let's talk about the three bills. I believe you're referring to Senate Bill 12, Senate Bill 14, and Senate Bill 15. And so Senate Bill 12, which uh, passed the legislature to prevent uh, sexually oriented performances in either public spaces where the children are or that don't allow someone younger than 18 to be part of that. What is your biggest concern on that legislation? We'll start with you. Well, it's really, it's just really to target the LGBT community and uh, drag performances. I mean, that's what the genesis of it is. And it's used as an intimidation tool to be able to come in and, uh, you know, prohibit uh, the LGBT community from celebrating uh, that, that constituency group. And, it's just unacceptable. You know, we don't need our government to specifically target um, our community in unfair and discriminatory ways. Right. And to add to that, most of the people who were um, supporting this bill actually never have gone to a drag show. And they've admitted it in several, you know, public platforms of never being able to, to be a part of these shows. These are shows um, that, are, that are supported by individuals um, that are bringing their family members to it. So it's not just children walking into the space and enjoying the show. It's usually, you know, a guardian, you know, that, that's bringing those individuals um, to the show. And somebody's 12 a.m. show is not going to be somebody's 12 p.m. show. And as uh, Representative Johnson mentioned, it's just a dog whistle uh, for attacks that are happening, that continue to happen on LGBTQ people throughout the legislative session um, that use women and children um, as the, the crux to, to, you know, to, to fuel this, you know, this oppression. But it was just uh, one more attack on LGBTQ people that unfortunately used our children uh, as the weapon to, to make those things happen. 
And Representative Jones, um, when I hear you talk, I hear you saying this is government overreach. Absolutely. Talk to me about that. Well, as a person who's worked in healthcare for over 20 years, um, there have been a, a number of conversations that, that we've worked to you know, advocate for, whether we talk about um, a woman's right to choose as far as the health of her body, or we're this very important conversation within the LGBTQ community, which is ensuring that all Texans have access to, to health care. And what this bill pretty much did was took the rights of uh, families to make the, the choices that they needed um, to be able to, to serve in the best health of their children. Not only those parents, taking the rights of those parents, but also medical providers, um, mental health professionals, and the team of people that it takes um, to go through um, helping transgender children um, navigate what is needed, the health care that, that they need. And so this was definitely an overreach because not only did this bill limit the surgeries, I mean, there are also actual stipulations in this legislation um, that also could endanger a doctor, um, could actually take a license from, from a doctor um, from doing what, exactly what they're supposed to do that's you know, in, a, in, a, in, in line with, with standards of care. Um, so it was definitely an overreach that are go that's going to have far-reaching implications, which to the point that we mentioned earlier has raised a lot of concerns for not just families, but also medical providers um, that have to, you know, a a acknowledge and understand and, and see what their future is going to be as far as providing care in the state of Texas. And you're referring to Senate Bill 14, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about that as well, Representative Johnson, as far as the legislature passing uh, this bill that would not allow anyone younger than 18 to receive uh, gender modification or um, any kind of treatments similar to that. Right, it's the any kind of treatment that is so significant mm -hmm. about this legislation. And the other aspect that is so significant is this is one of the first times where Texas has taken an aggressive stand to prohibit, prohibit parents from making the medical decisions that are necessary for their children. So now what we have is parents can go to trained medical professionals and combined make decisions on what's appropriate for their kids. And parents have a right to do that, in my opinion. But now, the, the state of Texas and the Republicans have said, no parents, we're taking your rights away to control the medical care of your children, and we're gonna make this decision for you, and we're gonna basically say, you have no rights when, this comes to, when it comes to this issue, when your children are struggling, when your children need care, when your children need the expertise of trained medical physicians, you don't get to do that in the state of Texas. When you hear Republicans uh, on Senate Bill 12, Senate Bill 14, they say this is really about protecting children with regards to Senate Bill 12, protecting children from sexualizing them uh, at a young age. Um, at, when it comes to Senate Bill 14, uh, the argument is these are children, uh, the, you know, who, after, the, you know, a change is made, it's permanent, can't, can't go back. And is this something where the child may, as an adult, regret the decision that was made? What do you say to that? Well, what I say to that is nobody knows their child better than the parent. Nobody has the best interest of their children in mind more so than their parents. I'm a mother. I have two sons. You know, I would walk on hot coals for my boys and whatever they needed. And then we have trained medical professionals who are very experienced in these issues in terms of mental health, in terms of prescription medications and therapies that can help children who are in this situation. And so as a parent, I am very resentful of the politics of the GOP, of politicians who don't know anything about it, who have never had transgender children, who've never been to a physician, who've never had to really explore down these issues, telling me as a parent what I can and cannot do, what I think is in the best interest of my children after I've consulted trained medical professionals. I think it's ridiculous. And how do you reconcile that with their same rights to say parents should not be forced to vaccinate their children? I mean, vaccines are universally regarded as important to the public health and safety of kids. 
and we've had a vaccine program for immunizing our elementary children for a very, very long time. But the Republicans are also saying, oh, but parents should have the right to make the decisions in their health care about not vaccinating their kids. So to me, I don't know how you reconcile the disparities of both of these positions because they make no sense other than their intent to discriminate and target the LGBT community. Representative Jones, did you have anything to add on that? It's a larger talking point that Representative Johnson already mentioned as far as it's kind of just red meat issues for Republicans and their base right now. One of the most telling um, situations that happened during the 88th legislative session was most people who sp spoke in support of this bill, including those uh, who, were, who were transgender, were from out of state. Nine, when we had the public health hearings, um, we had almost 3,000 people that registered to speak um, you know, for or against the bill. Over, I believe, about 2,500 were actual people in support of this bill. So there were no Texans that were coming. You know, the opposite. They were opposing uh, the bill. Sorry, they were opposing the bill, excuse me. Um, there were no Texans that really came in high numbers uh, to speak in support of this legislation. What you saw was families flooding into the Capitol day after day um, to speak against this legislation and desperately wanted to make sure that lawmakers heard the strong opposition uh, to these bills. Um, however, the people who spoke in support of these bills have been shipped across the country um, to go to these different legislative bodies um, to, to speak uh, for you know the, the, this this horrible act that that we're, that's happening to to people right now across this country. So I think that that's proof enough to know that this isn't something that that Texans families want or desire, and they just ran this through um, and spent so much time during the legislative session um, to make sure that this happened and that they delivered on this campaign promise. Did you both of you challenge your the Republican colleagues that you work with on this as it relates to? that issue as far as people coming from out of state to support these bills and then the other issue is on parental involvement and parental choice because we hear that in the educational space as well right oh absolutely we challenge them and that's one of the reasons why it's so important that we have elected lgbt members uh, because we do bring a personal uh, relationship and experience to the process when we can meet with people one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. and share our experiences and it does move the needle but you know uh, this bill was something that republicans campaigned on uh, they were determined to pass it and there was very little that we could do to stop this train from rolling that's right i wanted to ask you about senate bill 15 which was legislation that was passed to prohibit men who are transitioning to women from being able to compete against women in college sports, public universities, public colleges, which I think is a continuation from what was passed in 2021 with high school students, if I'm not mistaken. So tell me what, what your thought is about that and what is the reaction that you've received uh, from the community? Well, we've talked to a lot of, again, there was a lot of people coming in and out of the Capitol to, to speak uh, to make sure that we did no harm to LGBTQ people. And specifically related to SB 15, again, when we were on the House floor debating this bill, not a single amendment was accepted to be able to help make this bill, uh, to address the concerns about working with um, you know, NCAA's you know, regulations, um, but even for like inter you know, intercollegiate groups or other, other bodies, it was an absolute no across the board. And when we talk about what was the the issue that was used, like we want to have just, we want to be able to, to have, you know, competitive sports for, for women. We want to be able to have, uh, to make sure that there's no unequal advantage that was happening, but even for the things that had absolutely nothing to do uh, with compet competitive sports, it wasn't even something that was accepted. So again, it's just about the attack. It's just about making these things happen and not about what is being sold to individuals as the point of the problem. So I think that again, this was just another, another example of that happening. Well, and to that, to that point, there was not a single transgendered athlete in NCAA sports in the state of Texas, not one. So what is this bill trying to do, right? It's not like we've had some uh, terrible miscarriage of competitive opportunity in the state. 
So when you don't have that, you can't, there's not a single example of where that's happened in Texas, the, then you have to look at what's the real motivation behind this kinds of legislation. And it's a constant messaging that the transgender community isn't worthy and isn't important and has no value in the state. And we've seen that by the vast amount of bills that the Republicans keep offering. And our position is that is not accurate, it is not true. The LGBT community is vibrant, it's full of amazing people and amazing talent and amazing contributors to our society. And we have to just put up every single time when our state government tries to attack the LGBT community, we're here to say absolutely not, unacceptable, because that is all that this is trying to do. Absolutely, and I'll use another bill for an example that thankfully didn't make it out of committee, uh, but it was House Bill, um, I believe, it was, it was one of the House bills that actually would limit um, transgendered uh, women from being able to um, be in our state uh, um, correctional facilities. And when we asked the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, is this happening? The answer was no. The actual example and, and even the people brought in to um, be witnesses were people from the state of California. So. We have several issues in our, in our society and in our state where um, this alarm is being raised, but when we actually you know, ask a couple of questions to individuals, it's something that is not happening at all. So this, this false alarm around you know, what the LGBTQ community is doing, particularly um, tra uh, transgender individuals, it's, just, it's based on things that are, that are totally not true and really feeding into the fears and hatred of the Republican Party base uh, in order to I, I don't know, you'd have to, you'd have to ask them, but um, when, when we've asked these hard questions as far as where is this happening, how do we address the, the concerns that are happening, um, when, we, when we talk to those experts in those spaces, we oftentimes got the answer that this isn't happening. And they couldn't really you know, help, us, help us from there. So a lot, we've, we've had to fight against this kind of, this, 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 this fake monster. Um, you know, to, to get these things done. So it was very hard to have those conversations, um, but we did um, because we knew that it was very, it was important to Texans and their families, all Texans and their families right now, um, because you just never know where you do have an LGBTQ individual, whether they have, you know, shared that with their family or, or not, and that just continues to, to fuel the hatred and discrimination um, that, that's just not helpful right now in this moment. I'm wondering, because you mentioned before um, the other bills that were defeated. What are you worried about coming next? Just more of it. You know, what happens is we're able to defeat something one cycle, but then it's the next priority the next cycle. And they, the Republicans, they never have enough of targeting our community. You know, there are LGBTQ Texans in every single House district in this state. There are LGBTQ Texans in every single Senate district in this state. So these members that are pursuing this hateful legislation are turning their backs on those constituents because they think it'll score some political points with other constituents. And I find that to be reprehensible in terms of your obligations to all the people that you represent once you're in elected office. Did you have anything to add on that? No, not to that. I wanted to ask you about um, the LGBTQ caucus mm -hmm. that, I mean, you were part of the starting class, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And so I'm wondering, you have 45 members now, at least according to your website. Um, not all of them are in the gay community per se, but they're all Democrats. And I'm wondering, what do you think of that, uh, that all 45 members are Democrats? Well, I think it's great. I mean, in terms of, I think it shows the, a clear distinction between the Democratic and the Republican Party in terms of acceptance and equality for all people. And I love the fact that we have straight people and gay people all in our caucus. And it just shows that we have a commitment to the equality of everyone in the state of Texas and that we can understand that we may have differences and we all have, but we come together with a general foundational belief that everyone in this state 
deserves to live their life full and free and happiness free of discrimination and interference from its state government, regardless of what issue is yours. And so I applaud so many of our colleagues for joining the LGBT caucus. It's very unfortunate that we don't have Republicans, uh, but I do think it is really highlights a distinction in the parties in terms of how they value uh, their constituents. Absolutely. Well, as a freshman coming in uh, to, to the House this year, I think it was very inspiring to see this body, particularly this body in action. Um, when we first started, um, we were getting ready for those very hard conversations. But once the ball started rolling on um, these, the bills that were coming through that were attacking the LGBTQ community and the bills that were helping to, to help the LGBTQ community, uh, you saw this body you know, really come to action. And it wasn't just LGBTQ people because these issues shouldn't be just on the backs of LGBTQ people. Um, we are everywhere in, in this state and deserve that representation. So those members that were a member of the LGBTQ caucus um, also were members of the other, you know, other you know, caucuses. And so this, the issues that were happening that, that when attacking the LGBTQ community, you saw everyone um, that wanted to see justice, equity, and fairness for our, our communities really come to, to, to life and come to action. And that's what really gave, gave us the momentum that, that was needed to really fight you know, these bills because it was very exhausting to come in day after day after day to just another attack on LGBTQ people. And that's what it felt like going through these 140 days. When bills started moving, it was a fight we had to get ready for every week. Um, that was happening to LGBTQ people, and it was it was like clockwork. So the LGBTQ caucus, um, to me, was phenomenal, and and mobilizing a response and showing leadership um, and showing representation uh, for diverse Texans, um, particularly as it related to LGBTQ people and the texts that were coming on, particularly trans people and their families. And 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 this is my last question, but I wanted to ask you based on what you just told me. Or did you ever feel as if it was just you were overwhelmed personally because you have a personal stake in this issue mm -hmm. uh, besides representing uh, the, your communities? Mm -hmm. But did you ever feel like it was just it was too much? And, and what is your message to the gay and lesbian community out there? Absolutely. Well, my career was started fighting the HIV AIDS epidemic. And when we talk about the history of the HIV AIDS epidemic, the services and the advances that we have now didn't come without a fight. Um, there, were, there were protests at the CDC, there were, there were protests at the highest levels of government to make HIV uh, an issue. And it wasn't an issue because it primarily impacted LGBTQ people um, and also people of color. And so, the training that I received from working in HIV, advocating uh, for the lives of, of people living with HIV, being a person living with HIV, uh, I feel prepared me for, for this moment. Uh, so it wasn't overwhelming. It was just a very gentle and sometimes not so gentle <laughs> reminder of the fight that we still have to put forward uh, for, for justice in our, in, our, in our community. And I think that sometimes we we could get comfortable in the, the monumental achievements that we've been able to advance in the last 10 years. But understanding that in this very moment, all of those things on the table right now are, are under attack. And what I would say to individuals in the community and to individuals who care about what's happening to the community and to people in their family and to friends and to, to all spaces where LGBTQ people exist is that we have to stay vigilant. We have to stay involved in this process in a way that, that we never have before because as, as Representative Johnson stated, where it, if it didn't happen this, this session, it's gonna come up again. And we're going to have to keep on fighting. And we're gonna to have to make sure that ultimately, as we go into the next election cycle, we put the people in office um, that are gonna not just represent the people who vote for them, but they're gonna represent all Texans right now because that's what we were sent there to do. That's the oath that we took, and that's what we should be focusing on in this moment. You know, representation matters. That's. Uh, having a seat at the table matters. Uh, I've been fighting for LGBT equality for almost 28 years now. I've been in the trenches and to be able to transition my activism from 
into the elected world and being able to be in the Texas State House has been significant. To be able to bring to bear on a personal witness the impact that this kind of legislation has on our community. Um, but we have a long ways to go. We need to elect more people. We need to have a seat at the table uh, because it makes a huge difference. I did want to ask about another topic that the whole capital has been percolating about, um, and that is property tax reform, property tax relief. And in the last several weeks, as you know, uh, we've had this very public uh, back and forth between the governor and the lieutenant governor and the speaker over the best way to solve property tax relief. And um, what do you make of all this? These, these are the Republican leaders of the state, and they're on very different paths. And here you are as Democrats uh, in the minority in, in the House. And so I'm wondering, you know, what, what's your thought about all this that's going on? Well, I think it's ridiculous, honestly, that the Speaker, the Governor, and the Lieutenant Governor cannot come to an agreement on how to provide $17 billion of property tax relief to Texans. And, but what's even more ridiculous is that their communications with one another are all happening only on Twitter. I mean, think about that. Our state government is communicating via Twitter as opposed to meeting with each other, having productive discussions to reach a consensus. You know, uh, as a Democratic member of the House, uh, my constituents need property tax relief. It is hard to afford your home and it is hard to afford uh, staying in your home. And people are very concerned about the increasing, escalating rise in property taxes. And so uh, I have voted consistently to provide property tax relief and will continue to do so. But uh, it's just ridiculous that they cannot uh, use the power of the office and the great opportunity that the people of Texas have elected them to have to actually come together and work out something that makes sense. That's right. Representative Jones? Well, during the legislative session, we actually had a property tax relief plan that included compression, uh, appraisal caps, as well as homestead exemptions. Unfortunately, because we spent so much time attacking LGBTQ people, we didn't get that across the finish line. And so when we look at this fight for now property taxes, where it's now this, this hugely urgent issue is in, in regards to, according to Twitter, um, it's something that we should have been focusing on the entire time during the legislative session. But as I stated, we just spent week after week after week having the fight um, these bills, whether you were for or against it, it was a fight. It took time. It took staff resources. Uh, it took energy that we were that we desperately needed to to be focusing on affordable housing right now uh, for Texans right now. They need that, and every every second we we spend having to argue or having to go back and forth uh, to Austin or or having to, to go on to Twitter to. To, to see these issues being discussed, it's one more second that, that someone is having uh, to where they're having issues around making ends meet right now. And so I hope um, there's an agreement that, 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 that the governor and lieutenant governor and speaker uh, can be able to come to because I'm ready to make that vote and make sure that we provide property tax relief to Texans in this moment. Representatives Julie Johnson and Venton Jones, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank, thank you very much.